Hello and welcome to the Naked Eye podcast. This is Nathan Oxenfeld. And today I'm very pleased to be joined by Mayor Schneider, who has one of the more inspiring stories about natural vision improvement, who you know went from reading Braille early, earlier in life to passing the vision test at the DMV without glasses. Very honored to have you with me today, Mayor. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be in the show and I just want to give the audience a sense that my vision used to be 1% vision and now it is 70% vision. Um, the nice thing in California, I guess because of the old people lobbies, even with a reduced vision to the normal vision, they allow you to drive with no restriction uh, as long as you show that you can drive with no problem. And so I just last year got my license renewed for five more years. And I drive a lot, normally short distances, but with no incident. You have to understand, my parents were deaf, and I was known to be the blind kid of Ida and Abraham in Tel Aviv, to the whole deaf community in there. And um, uh, they were admonished for not giving me a white cane and a dog. I many times was hit by cars as I was crossing the street. Mm. So I started there. You know, I was the quickest Braille reader in the state of Israel. And now I drive and people tell me that bumps on the road are braille for blind, blind drivers like me. But basically I drive without any problem, without any incidents. You wouldn't see me crossing country, but I did drive to different parts of the state. Uh, sometimes a distance of 200 miles, I can do that. I will not drive thousands of miles. And my normal freeway driving is 15, 20 miles, but I normally drive in the neighborhood. And I'm very, very proud of that because it's a huge tra transition and transformation for me. Yeah, I mean, just that that mobility and, and independence and, you know, despite. Yeah, so we were really happy to have you in our documentary last year that we we went and visited you there at your space in, in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and you were telling us about, like, what you mean by, by the, way, the blind. By the way, I loved seeing you jumping on a trampoline. You're in good shape, my young guy. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I had to get rid of my big trampoline when uh, I had when I was in North Carolina. It didn't make it with me on the move, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll get another trampoline back at some point. <laughs> you should. You're in shape, and that is something we have to keep. You know. Yeah, and, and that, that was actually one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to chat with you about today is is your work with the trampoline and and body work and movement and stuff like but, that. But before that, I just wanted to say that somebody called me today and said, will working on the eyes keep? Well, here's my question that I asked her. If you do stretches in yoga, and then you, you sit on the chair all day long, do you think that your flexibility will keep? And she said, no. So, well, working on the eyes is a regular process. Losing vision is a process, whether you feel it or not. And gaining vision is a process. And so working on the eyes is a constant thing. So what I want to say is that you and the trampoline I want you to keep in shape to my age, you know, so, uh, and I'm more than twice your age, I think. So, I well, think and, and that's why I love, you know, the, the title of your work of vision for life, you know, it's like this um, lifelong endeavor and, and it's just a part of our lives. Absolutely. You can do all the best eye exercises and then sink on your phone for hours and hours. Guess what? You'll have to do them again. <laughs> So I just want to show everybody that uh, this is a normal lens. That this is my ex-wife lens. You know her, Dwol. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and this is my lens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and you can easily see the difference between um, normal lens and mine that was cut five times. Uh, by the way, my kids were born with cataracts as well but their lens was removed at the age of two weeks. Mm -hmm. And mine was done only at the age of four. And I was reading Braille after that because there was no way for me to see. I remember that I had to stay in kindergarten for an extra year because I was doing surgeries in my eyes. And they didn't understand in my generation that at the age of eight weeks is when you start to see. And if you don't see then, your brain erases the whole idea of seeing for the rest of your life. So uh, I didn't have a vision. In fact, the reason for legal blindness uh, in a major way in my time 
was kids or infants who were born with cataracts. Now, these days, those who are born with cataracts normally have about 20, 30% vision, and doctors are so happy with mm-hmm. the vision they have, although they, many of them have amazing amount of complications. Right. My kids see 100% vision, and that's a result of combining eye exercises and some other elements of our work and their life, and the surgery that was done on time. So the brain mm-hmm. s- got the light on time, but you know, the, I was even um, invited by them to their school, which were normal school. I had to be in a school that had a special class for kids who were reading Braille. You know, was, uh, we had to stay after the school was over. The school was eight to 12. And from 12 to two, we had to stay and get the special help with the Braille teachers. Mm-hmm. And they learn in regular schools, read regularly, they drive regularly. My daughter is doing a lot of paperwork because she's working for the city, helping homeless mm-hmm. people find home. Before that, she worked for, for grant writing and she's done a lot of that, including for one behavioral optometrist. And so ah, she even did the grant for our nonprofit uh, by the state of California, a small one for $15,000. But she's very good with paperwork they're both excellent drivers, especially my son. And, uh, and they uh, live normal visual life. And that is amazing with somebody who was born with cataracts. My faith was to be blind forever, with the exception of seeing some shadows, some shade here and there. And yet these days I can read, write, see birds from distance as I did today. Uh, uh, look at buildings easily, drive, and my reading is still from a near distance and I need good light, but I can read letters which are basically 20, 30 in size, which are much smaller than the normal uh, book print, and I can read any print in any book if I need to. Mm. And of course, I still listen to books while sitting down and palming and relaxing my eyes, but I was able to do all this, and I opened my, um, uh, with my uh, uh, work on myself, the possibility for many other people to improve the vision and later mm-hmm. on multiple cases. Yeah, that's, like I said at the beginning, like just even just hearing about your story and, and your experience, like watching um, your yoga for your eyes videos was were some of the very first videos I saw of people teaching the Bates method and demonstrating the palming like you showed. And, and so I definitely want to just thank you for making that and creating it because if I hadn't seen that, maybe I wouldn't have even considered that possibility quite as much. And so, yeah, in that time I had more hair, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was a little while ago. So I'm excited to, you know, hear what else you've been working on since then. But I, I am also curious to hear like what you, when, when you learned about the natural vision stuff and, and kind of what, you know, you latched onto with that and, and how you did regain it um, to such an extent. So I had an amazing uh, history. Uh, you know, as I told you, I was the quickest Braille reader in the state of Israel. Um, there were two kinds of, of schools, uh, 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 you know, uh, A through eight, I think first grade through uh, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Uh, One was a special institution in Jerusalem at that time, only for blind kids. And one was a school in Tel Aviv that uh, got you to be a member of a regular class and had a Braille uh, class where they would sit with you over the material that you learn. And in that time, it's interesting that the state of Israel I was able to enroll prisoners to type books in Braille. At that time it was Braille. Now it's, uh, Braille is not as popular as it used to be in my generation. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I didn't have the right books all the time. And I won't tell you, it was a rough time because I had kids who used my blindness in regular classes to try and take advantage of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, uh, four kids were standing behind me and somebody hit me in my head and I said, who did it and said, not me, not me, not me, you know, and I'll pick on someone, you know. And so it was a lot of uh, defending myself as a blind kid, always <laughs> being, re- almost being removed a few times 
from the school as a, a unruly kid, you know. Uh, also, um, my mother used to be in tears all the time when I would go and play with other kids because I would fall into pedals and uh, didn't see my way so much. So mm -hmm. in that time, you didn't have regular washing machine. She had to do it by hand. And that machine that you roll the, the machine several times was a handle. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mother would always be in tears seeing me. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, an interesting childhood that I had. I think in some ways it strengthened my character. Mm -hmm. I mean, I even was told, you know, that I'm not allowed to ride a bicycle because when I rode bicycles, I hit people, hit trees and went into ditches and to holes uh, and went down the stairs, like several flights of stairs downwards and mm -hmm. all kinds of things that happened to me uh, that really shaped my character, a real sense of um, opposition mm -hmm. to whatever... I basically wanted to do as a kid. And so you can understand that when I met a kid who was a high school dropout, who wrote, who read the books of Adolf Huxley and Dr. Peppard, and there was an amazing librarian who was very much into the life of movement and the art of movement. She overcame many problems, including hmm. paralysis and uh, strokes and many others. Uh, doing that and she loved books and uh, she shared those books with him and he got rid of his glasses mm. and he have shown me eye exercises mm -hmm. and uh, all my family was against it because I went to the top professors in the Middle East who are in Israel right uh, the best hospitals uh, that ruined my eyes, by the way. But uh, nevertheless, with the highest reputation there is. Right, yeah. And, um, and it's not their fault that they ruined my eyes, I must say. It was the common surgery in that time. Mm -hmm. It was experimental. The reason is they didn't understand why um, they do cataract surgeries to adults and with thick cataract glasses, the vision is close to normal. Mm -hmm. And why they do cataract surgeries to kids and nothing is normal. And they discovered, but 20 years after my time, that there is a critical time. And that is the first uh, eight weeks of an infant's development. And the brain is being blocked. And the time is eight weeks of life exactly. So it has to be done. That's why they do the first the two weeks because mm -hmm. after that they may do a secondary surgery and all that so by the age of six weeks you should have nothing wrong with you mm -hmm. uh, and so my kids did have to go through secondary surgeries and i must say my ex-wife discovered um that uh, something was growing in the lens capsule and all that mm -hmm. but they did have light coming to the retina and get, getting to the brain on time and they gave them very thick contact lenses, talking about reduction, uh, normally they give them 36 diopters. Which they can really see from near, so they can really look from near because that's what infants do, and then they reduce them and reduce them. Mm. My daughter's reduction came to the point from 36 diopters to um, 11 and a half in one eye and nine and a half in the other eye. So if you talk about real reduction, that's mm -hmm. reduction, right? Yeah. But yeah. their vision is nearly 2020, 2025 with the correction and 2050 without correction. My son's vision is 2040 without correction, without a lens. It should wow. be 2400, 2600. <laughs> and he sees 2015 with his glasses. This is amazing, right? Yeah, that's then, like what like uh, Dr. Bates talks about, like talks about those patients he had where he would remove the lenses from their eyes and expect them to not be able to focus or accommodate, but they still could, so. Right, what he didn't understand quite often, when you remove a lens of somebody very myopic, that the eyeball is long, and so the removal of the lens gets you to see pretty good from far. Mm. He didn't mm -hmm. get that. And there are many things he did not know, our good uh, teacher and uh, 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 <laughs> let's call him Rabbi Bates, you know. <laughs> and a few, few things he, he does know, he did know, but. If, uh, it's, it, we had to have a father 
to our method, and we have to have a father who will teach us quite a bit. But one of the important things is that the brain creates your vision to a great extent. A book, uh, The Healing Brain, says it takes the FDA sometimes two years to approve a drug. Mm-hmm. It took the brain sometimes a million years to, occur, to approve healing. And the brain expects the human eye to look at a distance. But we're spending most of our time looking from near. You and I are right now looking from near as we talk about vision improvement. That's why the two of us should immediately, when we finish this conversation, look at a distance and rest the eyes of what we were doing. So uh, what I'm saying is we definitely don't live natural life for our body and for our eyes these days. And for our body, we pay a big price. I'm so happy to see in which, at least I'm happy for what I saw, in what great shape you are. Uh, most people, even though you're young, are not in as good shape as you are. And they're stiff, and stiffness becomes arthritis and back pain and all kinds of other problems. And so many people are paralyzed when they shouldn't really be paralyzed. And, uh, and so the whole human health is being compromised. And our two biggest enemies are the chair and the shoes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the chair gets us to sit and ruin our hips on a regular basis. Just think about this kind of posture that you have yeah. when you sit on a chair like this. This is kind of bending, this kind of posture. And think what your neck does. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the main reasons for blindness in old age is poor blood flow to the visual system. Starting with glaucoma, the optic nerve gets destroyed with not having enough blood flow. Continuing with um, uh, neurovascularization. And there's two problems for poor blood flow. Poor use of the eye itself leads to poor blood flow. And stiff neck leads to poor blood flow. And there's nothing as bad as a stiff neck for your health because it can also lead to strokes. But there's also many strokes of the eye and many strokes of the optic nerve. And so glaucoma, neurovascularization, wet macular degeneration, even drusen of the macula, all that is a result of poor blood flow to the visual system. And it is a daily work for us to prevent that from happening. And the medical uh, treatment is always partial and always leads to partial results. I'm not saying I want to give up on that treatment. I send my two kids for it. The cataract surgeries. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and 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 sometimes I sense some. I mean, look, if you have a beginning of cataract, I'll work with you very hard, so you will not have the cataract expand. And that happens. It happens in about eighty percent of the cases. People come to me, and the cataract does not expand over a period of 15, 20 years. Okay. Mm. Uh, but there is also a, a situation where the cataract creates such a great opacity that you actually can't see. Yesterday, I actually talked to somebody. One of her eyes really sees poorly. And I suggested for her to have cataract surgery, but the surgeon wants to do cataract surgeries in both eyes. I said, why Why the other eye? Don't do that. She, she was afraid he won't do the one eye if she refused to do the other eye. But I said, well, just cancel the surgery uh, conveniently, you know. But yeah. you don't need to do surgeries up front. And most cataract surgeries could be prevented. But once the cataract is very thick, it makes no sense to me not to remove the lens <laughs> so you have vision. Uh, so uh, th- there is a place for medicine and there's a place for the injection that they give to the, for the macula. But I know of that one woman who did with me six weeks of practice. And then she said, I went to my physician and she said, we need no injection because you have no bleeding. And that's yeah. what we want to get, you know? That's what we want to get. So the point is prevention of eye problems start with doing eye exercises. And don't imagine that if you don't do the eye exercises, you will not have eye problems because the eye exercise should be a part of your life. It's just like if you go without sleep, do you imagine you're not going to have problems? Mm. If you go without brushing your teeth, do you imagine you're not going to have decay in your mouth? If, if you don't rest your eyes enough, if you don't adapt them to the sun, if you don't pay attention to your periphery, if you don't look at details, if you don't look at the distance, you're going to lose your organs, your eyes one by one. Not looking at the distance gets you to the, to lose your lens and look how many cataract surgeries we have these days. Not looking at details makes you lose your macula. So yeah, right now you wear the glasses, you see very well with them, even though your gaze is frozen. But give it 20, 30 years and you'll have macular degeneration. 
Mm. And that's a big point. Yeah. And and the and the circulation piece is is so big. I, I feel like one thing that I've I've taken away from attending your talks and classes and workshops is is that's a big emphasis you you really bring into it is movement, even some body work techniques and uh, loosening up the muscles and getting that that flow. Absolutely. How can you get better if your neck is stiff? It's impossible. Yeah. I mean, you want, I mean, it's, it's like the muscles will be uh, like uh, basically squeezing your blood vessels, just mm -hmm. like kids used to do, like they call it Indian burns in English, I think. Mm -hmm. And we called it pins and needles in Hebrew, mm -hmm. where they would squeeze your arms like this until you have pins and needles in your hand. Well, mm -hmm. that's what the muscles are doing here. If they tense a lot, if the jaw is tight and they tense a lot, then you don't get enough blood flow to the visual system. Now, what's amazing about it is your neck tension starts in your toes. That's what most people don't know. That if you don't mobilize the toes enough, as most people don't, because they're stuck in shoes and cement. I'm walking, I'm sitting right now bare feet on the carpet. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, you're going to see me walking on the beach. And the only reason I was wearing shoes today in my walk is I walked in the park, but I was happy to walk on gravel. But the, the, the enemy for your neck is your shoes, cement, uh, and, and rigidity. And so if your toes are weak, um, and most of the flesh of your foot is the muscles of the toes, your ankles will be stiff. And if they're stiff, so will be your knees. And if your knees are stiff, so will be your hip joints. And if your hip joints are stiff, so will be your lower back. Guess what happens? When the lower back is stiff, there are many digestive problems because you affect peristalsis to the words. I can tell you that um, I feel a great relief in my digestive system whenever I do my stretches and lying on the floor and things yeah. of that nature. But then if, again, if your toes are weak and your ankles are stiff and your uh, then knees become stiff and the hip joints become stiff. And by the way, that's why hip replacement specialists have a lot of money these days, right? So if your hip is stiff and your lower back is stiff, then your middle back will be stiff. And guess what? In my opinion, many people die from heart problems 30 or 40 years before they should. The lungs and the heart are affected with middle back stiffness. And if the middle back is stiff, so will be the shoulders. And if the shoulders are stiff, so will be the neck. And so will be the jaw. And anytime I work with people with hearing problem or seeing problem, if they allow me, I take a glove and I work inside the mouth and loosen up the jaw because the jaw becomes very stiff with many people and so is the neck. So what I want to say, which is very, very important, is that basically 85% of blinding condition of old age is a result of poor blood flow to the visual system. And everything else is a patch approach. Yeah, I mean, if you have high pressure because of glaucoma and Maybe they have no choice but to take drops. So I can tell you that my daughter had a very high pressure and she didn't take drops and the pressure became normal with the loosening of the neck and the exercise that we did. And also with um, uh, a, a change of a mental state and things of that nature. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, a very, very important thing. Uh, we need to work on our inner emotional self and see where there's a conflict which is unresolved and see if we can resolve it. You know, uh, it's one thing if you lose a partner. For example, my partner, Jeanne, lost her husband to diabetes. And that was a very sad moment for her. There's no question. It was uh, yeah. devastating. But her relationship with him was good relationship. So at the end of the day, it is sadness but then there's always the next day and you do something new with your life, you know? But often a mother died and a daughter didn't complete her peace with her mother. Mm, you know, right, when yeah. I fight with my sister, I'm getting myself the understanding, you know, she is important to me. And I could isolate myself all I want with judgment about her being dictatorial, about her being a narcissist, whatever have you. I could do that. But then it means that when she dies and I die, it's not going to be peaceful. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, 
to create peace with your relatives, with your best of friends, that becomes a very, very important thing. So, yeah, uh, and that and that goes well beyond <clears throat> your eye exercises, right? <laughs> That's actually like interpersonal relationships and communication, and 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 I I attribute you know that to part of my vision healing journey was you know healing some relationships and. Um, you know, dealing with, with family things and, and friendships and stuff. So, yeah, that's, I think, one of the more subtle pieces that but maybe... But eye exercises often brings all of it up. Right, and right. Mm -hmm. too, you know, as you improve your eyes, let's say you had five diopters, you went down to two. Fine. This two will never go away unless you start to work on what right. caused them in the first place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it's like you've got your physical diopters and your emotional diopters and your psychological ones. And <laughs> well, no question. Yeah, no question. Yeah. They're all related. But let's return to the physical. The reason why we here in San Francisco are by the beach, which is a very good place to be, uh, is that we want people to look at the distance with great pleasure. And when mm. you look at waves, it's so pleasurable. Every day they're a bit different, you know. And um, I think that people should look at the sky and people should look at the horizons on a regular basis. That's what our ancestors did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, until now, my uh, partner is driving me crazy because every time we're walking, look at this and look at that and look at that and look at that. But, you know, sometimes I remember, I'll never forget the one time we sat on the bench and I did look. I looked at the trees in front of us and all that kept describing to her how lovely it is. She said, yeah, but you know, there are buildings ahead of that. I said, really? And then I saw, yes, you could actually through the trees see those buildings. And as soon as that happened, my whole face relaxed. Mm. Because in my opinion, this is so important for people to know, poor vision leads to a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. Poor vision leads to a lot of tension. Not only tension leads to poor vision, if, if you would see blind people, quite often they strain with their eyes more than sighted people. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like, you know, you may relax when you sit, but you're not necessarily relaxed if you have to be in the wheelchair all day long, right? Right, or right. I may relax when I sit, but it's definitely not relaxing to sit in an airplane, right? When you fly <laughs> to France uh, from San Francisco, or when you fly to San Francisco from France. Yeah. So sitting for a long time is not a very, very relaxing thing. And not seeing well and having a continuous strain to see is not relaxing. So one of the things that I'm demanding for my students in my class and my individual students is to really not strain to see, but to see what you see and to be okay with that. And it's, it's interesting. If you do accept that, your vision always gets better. Yeah. Uh, I have a mirror in my bathroom. So, uh, uh, some a friend of mine wanted me to put that mirror. But I have a sink between me and the mirror. So often my face doesn't look so clear to me. Mm -hmm. Until I turn the light on, then it's clear. Then I turn the light off and I can still trace whatever was clear with the light. Mm. So if you your mind starts to follow what is clear to you and follows more and more, it's really good. Because, you know, people, just like people like myself, and I must say I admit myself, don't give up on sugar so easily, right? Especially chocolates. <laughs> um, uh, I would say people don't give up on the good vision they have with the glasses now. And the point is, there's also later. So how about enjoying what you see now is what you have mm -hmm. and then allowing yourself to slowly, slowly see better. If it leads to conflict, it's a problem. If it doesn't lead to conflict, it's great. That's a cool analogy of uh, kind of comparing the artificial clarity we get from glasses, like artificial sugars <laughs> in, our, uh, in our sweets and stuff. It's like a big dose to the brain. But I really like how you're, you're helping us trace the eye strain that we might feel kind of back to the roots or to the sources, like actually tracing it down to the toes and the feet and stuff. And actually just earlier today, um, I was reading one of my 
comments underneath one of my other YouTube videos and somebody said, I, we were talking about glasses and how they can kind of sometimes feel like barriers between you and the world. And they said, uh, I feel the same way about shoes. When I go to the park with shoes, I feel like my guard is up and I'm less willing to connect with people. When I go barefoot, it's amazing the difference in my mood and my outlook. And so that, that sounds like maybe this person is actually feeling that connection between the foot mobility, the toes and, and the eyes and the mood. That's kind of an interesting component there too. Absolutely. If your eyes are stressed, you're going to think all the most negative thoughts that can cause them even more stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a big deal. So I think it's very important for us to know also the fingers have a lot to do with it. We uh -huh. used to be flexing them for the mouse, for the paper, and we're not extending them enough mm -hmm. to stretch them and to relax them. That's why before palming, I'm asking for uh, my students to move yeah. their arms in rotating motion and relax them and then rub them and then palm. Mm -hmm. So the point is, you know, uh, when the fingers are stiff, so will be the uh, forearms, so will be the elbow, so will be the shoulder, and so will be the neck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that my classes always do, my training courses, this time is not the vision class, the one we're going to have on February, uh, but the training course, the one I'm going to have in May, uh, the training courses, we're starting every day by walking and running backwards. Mm. Very, very important. Because as you walk backwards, you don't, I mean, you do look when you walk to make sure everything is good. That by itself is a good stretch. But as you walk backwards and as you run backwards, you start to use parts of your body that you normally mm. don't use. And so that's a, a very, very important thing for us. I remember you talked a lot about not just like mobility and circulation, but specifically like activating dormant muscles or muscles that you don't use in like your everyday tasks and stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, we need to run sideways. I mean, mm -hmm. we used to climb on trees. If you walk like this, uh, if you walk like this in the street, um, they will all know you studied with me. You know? <laughs> like, um, I always tell people, you had good reputation till you met me, right? You know, <laughs> you stop. But, uh, but basically, um, uh, we, we have canceled many of the movements that are available for us. And so, you know, this bunker ball, uh, you can get online for a pretty inexpensive price. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is so nice. You can hit yourself between your shoulders. Mm. You, know, like thinking about, you can hit every part of your body. We become so stiff in life. And the worst part about that stiffness, we don't even feel how stiff we become. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and as we become stiff, that prevents us from having blood flow. That gives us negative thinking. That's what's increasing or, uh, or decreasing our blood pressure. A lot of wrong is happening in the body because of the stiffness of the body. To learn how to sense the body kinesthetically and work with it nicely. And so working on the eyes cannot be separate from working on the body. It's very, mm -hmm. very important to work on both. And I think when people experience vision changes or vision issues, I feel like we get really hyper focused just up on the eyes and, and the face and everything. And we sort of forget the role that the rest of the body plays. So it's a really good reminder to, to treat it like a full body experience and, and explore that kinesthetic aspect of it, not just the visual aspect of it. That's right. And if you think about losing vision to glaucoma, for example, I mean, what's glaucoma? It's basically the generation of the optic nerve. Uh, so pressure in the eye could cause it. But lack of blood flow to the head could cause it as well. Mm -hmm. And lack of blood flow to the eyes, which means also lack of, lack of blood flow to the head, can also create high pressure. So learning to reduce the pressure is one thing. And by the way, it's a, it's a, I want to tell you the story that I had a family that came to me all the way from Israel because the girl was born with cataracts in both eyes. They did two surgeries on her and with one of them, uh, she became blind and the other one of them, she was able to see. And against my advice, they put prosthesis in her eye. 
Uh, and the, the advice of the doctors was to put prosthesis on the bones, will grow normally. I have another kid that didn't put prosthesis in his eye and his eye grew normally and the bones grew normally in his eye. So, because we did light therapy in his eye. So mm. that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But in her case, I met her in my parents' uh, apartment in Tel Aviv. And so when I told them, they started with drops because her pressure went up from 17, you know, normal pressure is 10 to 20. And her pressure went down to 27 from 17. Mm. The doctor started drops and said, don't. Uh, I said, I, I wish I could see it for a couple of weeks. Guess what? Within a week, the whole family came to me for two weeks of treatment. It was amazing. I mean, this is 24 hours door to door type mm. of travel, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the family was the mother, the father, mm -hmm. uh, her, her sister is a year and a half, and, and uh, the mother in law. So they come here, and I work with, with her. And we spend two weeks, and we've done all kinds of wonderful work on the trampoline, and with toys, with work, and all this. Uh, we put a little, what we call, melicinia, a small piece of paper in the eye that sees, and got her to look one way, got her to look another way, and all this. It was fantastic. And then, and then uh, we met, we, I went to a friend of mine, physician, and the pressure was 27. Didn't go down. So um, he pressured them to take drops. And I said, let's wait. So I waited three more weeks for another doctor to come. And then I all of a sudden remember, there was a kid who came to me with an enlarged heart. Mm -hmm. And when I would touch his heart and my heart, his beat was 104, mine was 72. Both of us, both of our beats became 84. And I said, well, this is interesting. There's more to that story, but I'll leave that story. And I'll come back to the girl. So I put one hand over my eye and one hand over her. Like two fingers here and two fingers there. Mm -hmm. And then the other way, and then I told the father to do it, the mother to do it. Mm -hmm. Then we put one hand over her eye and one hand over her sister eye. Mm -hmm. and I got even my uh, secretary in that time, we put one hand over her eye. And when we went to Dr. Hoyt three weeks later, and I was surprised the parents waited three more weeks, mm -hmm. yeah? They didn't leave, they didn't protest, they didn't get pissed, they just wanted to see how to help the girl. Her pressure went down from 27 to 11. Wow. Huh? So sometimes just touching and touching and the connection between the body can lead to a huge reduction of pressure. Yeah, I remember I remember you led us through that in Buenos Aires and uh, at the end of one of your talks. And it was really cool to, to just look around the whole room of people sitting across from each other, kind of doing this like exchange with each other and kind of reminds me of, of like entrainment, like th this concept where you're, you're synchronizing and, and kind of getting in tune with each other. And, but, but that's such a, a cool, simple strategy um, that sounds like it had a pretty profound effect. Absolutely. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so that's, that's one interesting situation. And I had so many people who were able to get rid of the drops as the neck got mm -hmm. looser, which was a great thing. Um, I found that sunning, by the way, reduces your pressure by two points at any time. Mm -hmm. And lately I had pretty interesting success in the other way. In fact, I'm gonna have a session with that client uh, about two hours after I'm finishing with you. Two, oh, two, and, two and a half hours probably after I finish with you. Uh, she's a lawyer, a human activist lawyer in Australia. And um, she took medication against rush because she had rush in her legs. And the medication led to so much side effect and much more rush that they cut her two legs. She became an amputee hmm. uh, from the knee down. Mm -hmm which was awful. And then they cut part of her finger and she lost one eye, the right eye. Mm. In my opinion, to prednisone, if you ask me. I mean, those drugs are more potent than one thing and they go in both ways. 
Mm. And, uh, you know, normal pressure is 10 to 20. 20 and I consider to be high, unless you have what they call these days normal tension glaucoma. Oh, yeah. In the past, you used to call it uh, low tension glaucoma. That means that they don't want you to have 15. They want to have you 15 or less. Some of them are uh, one in 12, you know, but, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hers was two. Just mm. imagine driving your car without air in the tire. Right. So hers was two. And we worked and we did the exercise that we did, that I always do. It went up to nine and I saved. Right? Just one point below what's considered to be normal. Yeah. Then the other eye, they couldn't put an artificial eye. They couldn't put an artificial eye because of the fact that um, the orbit never healed. And I heard from someone who called me, the doctor suggested to remove his eye because it hurt and it was blind from glaucoma. I said, do you still see light? He said, yes. He said, why don't we work a bit on the eye? No, no, I'm going to remove my eye. They think that there's always free lunch here. You <laughs> think that you do the medical procedure and all is well afterwards. No, sir. No, madam. Not necessarily. Well, the eye did not heal for a whole year, okay? So uh, she, she uh, had with me a session a few weeks ago, and I told her to patch her left seeing eye and to face the sun with the empty orbit. Mm -hmm. And ask her to ask the surgeon to get her off the antibiotic. He gave a flood of antibiotic. And guess what? The orbit heal, mm. and she could put the artificial eye in. She cool. was very self-conscious, which I teach yeah. people not to be around me. I get people who have deformity, people who have all kinds of problems, and mm. I love them all. You know, I work with everyone any way I can. And so two things we achieved with her. Save the seeing eye, and she's a human rights lawyer, and I wanted to keep doing her activity. Uh, she is doing better as a result of this. And I had another interesting case though, was a lady who wanted to be paid back for pinhole glasses. Why? Because there's a curtain in the pinhole glasses that we sell. Well, I knew there's no curtain in the pinhole glasses we sell, but yeah. who's going to, who, who's going to bother talking about 30 bucks? Get the money, send me the glasses. No problem. Well, two weeks later, she called us and said, ah, actually have medical uh, uh, macula pucker. Mm. Growth going out, out of the macula. It's, it's, it's a pucker. And so my vision is really poor. So we met on Zoom three times a week for two and a half hours, then two times a week, then one times a week. And that's what happened in the last half an hour. She went to a doctor back who wanted to do a, a surgery called vitrectomy. Mm -hmm which he knew could cause many problems. And nine, uh, um, nine, uh, one out of nine cases, it leads to blindness. Because after you do vitrectomy, normally there's cataract, they have to remove the lens, and then there's uh, other complications, they have to peel the retina. Billions of problems happen. But yeah. he wanted to do vitrectomy. And I, I really think, it, uh, I've met even some people in the vets community that think that they should just go and do an act a surgery because it's offered. It's, you really have to think twice before you do a thing like this because mm -hmm. it could lead to many, many problems, okay? What happened is I asked her, can the surgeon allow you to wait a little bit? She said yes, and she went to another surgeon to confirm that we can wait for the retractomy. Mm -hmm. And we worked, and her puckered have decreased by a lot. I want to show you the picture of this. Uh, this is March, and you can see the thickness here. This is yeah. August. Huge difference between them. And he said it's the first time he saw a thing like this. And I like to make the wow. big statement, just like when you look at my eyes. Yeah. And can you see my eyes? Show my eyes again. Just like when you look at my eyes. Uh, if you look at the, de the deficit I have in my eyes, you'd say, how can this person ever see? Well, let me say something important. Function leads to structure. Thought leads to function. That's why we touch that whole point of thinking, you know? So thought leads to function. Mm -hmm. And I would say that 90% of all surgeries 
would be prevented. And you, you just heard me that sometimes I send people for surgeries. Yeah. 90% of surgeries could be prevented and 90% of reoccurring surgeries could be prevented if we just work on improving the function of the eyes through relaxation, adaptation to different light frequencies, the night and the day, not escaping the sun, but adapting to the sun. That is so important. All the medical profession tell us to escape the sun. That's not the right thing to do. We need to adapt to it because we see better and better the stronger the light is that we can stand. I'm not saying never wear sunglasses if you drive to a sunrise or sunset. Right. And the sun is in your eyes and the visor doesn't do the full job. Okay, wear sunglasses for a few minutes. But other than that, don't, don't do that. Uh, it, it affects your mood, it affects everything else. You know, uh, Bob Hopdale, one of our friends, yeah, he's talking about the fact the sun is healing every part of the body. Um, you know him, don't you? I don't. Uh-uh. Uh, I would recommend you interview him. He's a great English fellow. But, uh, but the sun definitely um, affects your heart, affects everything. Through your eyes, your mood can get better. There is no better antidepressant than the sun itself. But we also have to adjust to the dark of the night. We don't have night. In Birmingham, not in Birmingham itself, but in the area, you may fi find having some night, you know. Yeah, if I go go a little outside of the city, uh, outside of Burlington, I've been able to see the, well, you, actually, even from my porch, I've been able to see the Milky Way on a clear night. So Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. The bears like that place too, don't they? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so make sure you don't meet, you don't meet uh, all kinds of creatures that think you're food, you know. But uh, going out there is what uh, we did as human beings for a long, long time, right? And so um, adapting to different light frequencies, looking at details. We lost curiosity about details. And I can tell you for myself, for me, the whole world was one big smudge. Yeah, I learned yeah. to look at smaller areas, head versus shoulders, uh, upper body versus lower body, and slowly, slowly looked and looked and looked at more details. So looking at details is so important, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing is, are looking at a distance. That's why people lose their lens. Looking at the distance, letting the lens be flat is a very, very important thing. Um, and then expanding our peripheral vision. Uh, I, I will never forget how I stood in the library and a lady looked at her iPhone and I stood this close to her. Uh -huh. Attention. <laughs> After five minutes, she ordered, I said, you know, I'm standing close to you. Did you see me? She said, no, did you pay attention? I said, no. I said, great. Now I have a good thing to say to the audience uh, that I'm going to lecture to a few minutes from now. And just imagine in the jungle, you don't pay attention. Imagine yourself, you go at night and there are bears there and you don't pay attention to them. What can happen to you, you know? Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the point is, the point is, we would never survive the jungle without knowing our periphery. Our periphery is so important, or else we are food, so to speak. So paying attention to the periphery is so important, and not paying attention is a visual stress that can lead to central problems like macular degeneration. Right. And to peripheral problems like glaucoma, you know? And then, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, some people who already were born with a problem have to do all that so the problem will diminish because I work with many people who are born with genes for retinitis pigmentosa, genes <laughs> for labor syndrome, genes for all kinds of problems. But you have to work on that, on, on all the elements I was saying, relaxation, um, adaptation to light frequencies, looking at details, looking at distance, paying attention to the periphery, and then balancing the use of the two eyes, balancing the use within each eye. Eye and body coordination is so important. I'll never forget the person who have an elective surgery in his heart and got a stroke of the optic nerve. And his okay. uh, uh, field vision developed, his field developed, uh, basically lost from 100% to 15%. Wow. And uh, he saw me in Brazil and then he came here and I got him to bounce on a trampoline and he sees one arrow pointing to the right and he bounced to the right, clap his hands, one arrow pointing to the left, bounce to the left, clap, move his arms, 
bounce on his knees with an arrow that points down, bound, bounce on his bum whenever points up and go back and forth, back and forth, and with a lot of other exercise, of course, uh, including an exercise where we put a paper from the forehead to the chin and throw a ball from side to side. Mm -hmm. Well, his field of vision improved to 85%. Wow. Uh, and so the, the last principle is, of course, where we started today, and this is more blood circulation to your yeah. visual system. Very, very important. If you want to be compliant to the eye exercises, you need that circulation. And yeah. uh, uh, people need to do that. And that means variety of movements. And that means not being lazy. And that means moving every day. And some people think that strain leads to better blood flow. Sometimes it reduces it. So measured strain is good, but mainly movement. Movement and studying the movement we normally don't do and increasing that capacity within us. Yeah, I feel like when I first learned about, you know, how, how to work on improving my vision, I, I sort of started thinking about my vision is blurry. I must need to kind of strengthen my muscles, but really muscle strength wasn't really the right way to think about it. And, and now I kind of think about it more like, more like muscle tone, where I want my muscles to be toned, but I'm not necessarily like, you know, pumping iron and, and building a bunch of, of muscle strength and mass. Specifically, I'm talking about my eye muscles. No, but even um, about that muscle strength, mm -hmm. it only lasts so long. Right, yeah. Right is, and eventually the weakening of the muscles, it only lasts so long, and then you lose it. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a really cool overview, though, of, of these different principles and, and some of your approaches of, of really, you know, coordinating people through this process and, and what it might look like and feel like and what, what the sense that I'm getting is that you've given some really amazing examples of some, you know, significant vision challenges that people have, whether they're eye diseases or, or things that would be considered, you know, more irreversible, so to speak. And I just want to point out that maybe some of the people who are listening, who are dealing with a refractive error, like myopia or astigmatism or something, you know, it, it, if this stuff can work for, for glaucoma and, and the eye pressure and macular puckers and cataracts and things it hopefully will seem that much more accessible and, and applicable to something like a refractive error that, you know, it, it's its own different category, but um, it, it's not really in a sense in that kind of eye disease category, but um, can definitely feel that way sometimes. <laughs> And let me say something else. Just wearing glasses means neglecting your, your eyes. Because means what? Neglecting your eyes. Oh, yes. Because now you see well. Okay, now you see well. Uh, it's just like seeing the movie Super Size Me with McDonald's food, you know. Mm -hmm. You eat. It feels great when you eat. It feels great when you finish. Wait an hour later, right? Yeah. So the point is, uh, now you see well. But what's later? Right. What's later is all the reasons of why you don't see well are there and you didn't take care of them. So, for example, to give you a closing thing is my partner, Jean, you know, uh, for whatever reason. And I think a lot of it had to do with what she had to go through, but also with the fact that she was working a lot in front of the computer. Uh, she ended up having a lamoral, lamoral uh, what was it? Um, Laminar pseudo, pseudo hole in the retina. And they wanted to do a vitrectomy. And they put on her pressure for a year and a half to do it. And she tried all kinds of things. And I think it's nice that she did, you know, uh, colonic therapy. Uh, I was uh, standing in the forest with, uh, 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 was basically closing her eyes and covering them and, and uh, did all kinds of shaman work psychological work, mental work, anything. And the surgeon still wanted to remove her vitreous. And then she discovered me and she, she went to a bookstore and saw yoga for your eyes. You know, this um, one that you worked with it used to be actually red. Now it's blue, you know, yeah. uh, yoga for your eyes. Uh, in a book by a nice guy by the name of Raymond Francis, uh, belated Raymond Francis, who wrote a book on diet. Mm. 
And so she read about it. She thought that uh, Quebec and San Francisco are far. And, you know, it does take some time to get there. But when she heard I'm going to New York to promote this book, which is Vision for Life, mm. that's yeah. already a second print of the second edition. Uh, nice. So she went to, um, uh, to uh, uh, see me in New York. Uh, and then we had a session and uh, lectures and workshop. She went home with the book and diligently worked on herself. And a month later, she saw her ophthalmologist who said, the vitrectomy is not necessary. Mm. Now it's nearly 10 years later and she's being told again and again, it's stable. So what I want to say is things can change and, and the best thing to do is not to fight with your glasses, but to work for better vision. And one of course of the ways that we do it is we go to an open-minded optometrist get some reduction in our lenses and then um, uh, use uh, pinholes and put the glasses in the pocket and use them as instruments. And the best example I have is my daughter. She takes away glasses whenever she can, even though she doesn't have a natural lens. And in the past, they, they were always thick. And whenever they were uh, over... Uh, uh, 12 diopters, you always had to have it produced um, by an optician and you had to go to an optometrist. When it's 11 and a half diopters, actually 12 diopters and less, you can get from the internet for 90 bucks. So right. About that. So the point is she, within the high range, came to the normal category. Remember, she started at 36. Yeah. What, I want, what I want to say is that if you have five diopters, it's not nothing that you go down to three diopters. It's a big deal. It means it's just like somebody who has braces and crutches. Now he doesn't have uh, braces, only crutches. That's a big deal. Or somebody who walks now with the crutches and now only with a cane. That's a big deal. If you have reduced your prescription and now with a reduced prescription, you see really well, that's a big deal. It means that your eyes have strengthened and they're on their path to get better instead of getting worse all the time. And glasses are dangerous in that they, in many ways, but the main way that I'm thinking about, they're really, really dangerous in that they prevent you from seeing well with the, uh, for the future and taking the stress out of your eyes with the comfort of seeing well now. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's an important pe thing for people to hear especially people who are already on this journey and they've already maybe started to use weaker glasses because i feel like some people might think that they're able to go from braces to nothing you know having braces on their legs to nothing and i really appreciate how you pointed out the the stepping stones braces to crutches crutches to cane cane to nothing and so yeah that to kind of put it into perspective for for some people might be really helpful because it is a it's an ongoing journey Happens to be I work with both kind of cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, really, seeing better is something that it's going to help you for the rest of your life. It's <laughs> a lifelong process. I'm, people think as if you get a prison sentence if I'm asking you to relax your eyes. <laughs> no, I think you're actually <laughs> getting a new dimension to your life. So yeah. the, the big thing is that you can do it. So I really want people to uh, go to Nathan and work with him. And those of you who can come to my workshop on February 10th to the 15th. Uh, it's a six day workshop. We have as much as 93% success mm. of people who come and see better in the last day. We always, we normally measure the vision in the beginning and at the end, and their vision is better. Often yeah. by four lines on the chart. Now, keeping it has to do with working with it. And 50% right. of the people do that. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. The difference between the the initial improvements versus the more longer lasting ones. And I mean, I I saw improvements in, in just one one day of working with you. And um and so is that is that a in-person thing there in, in San Francisco in yeah. February? By the beach. We don't awesome. use the beach a lot. And um, you know, especially people back east, like the beautiful town of Burlington. Uh, if they can come from uh, 
the freezing weather there to the moderate weather in San Francisco, it'd be great. Mm -hmm. Summer yeah. better stay in Burlington because we're, it's foggy here, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, know yeah. you know what Mark Twain said about San Francisco, right? What's that? The coldest winter I ever spent was one summer in San Francisco, right? <laughs> <laughs> but right. Uh, it's not that cold. It's yeah, crazy. yeah. And where, where can people find out a little bit more about that experience? So call us at 415-665-9574 or write to us to office manager at self-healing.org. And my office manager is Jean, the one who improved the vision a lot and became my partner. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll make sure I, I put that information in the description and stuff so people can check it out. Because, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's quite an experience and to be able to do like multiple days in a row there, like an immersion, I think is ultra powerful. And I think that that's kind of how Dr. Bates did it a hundred years ago. People would come from all around and, and go visit him in his clinic and, and kind of really dive into it until they got the improvements. So, um, yeah, so the first day we talk about the introduction to all the principles that I described here. The second day is overcoming nearsightedness and farsightedness. The third day is uh, uh, balance use of the eyes. And we even have a field trip to look at a distance to create that. The fourth day is overcoming pathologies. The fifth day will include a nice night walk and a dinner, but uh, also continuing all the work on balancing the use of the eyes because that takes long. And the sixth day is working on daily work on ourselves. And it's very powerful. That's so important because I think it's it's one thing to learn this stuff and then another thing to be able to really implement it into your everyday life. Kind of like what I was trying to do with my yoga teacher training. It's like, okay, this one month at the ashram, I'm going to be so embedded in this. But then when I go out into the real world, so to speak, you know, how, how do I actually keep carrying this over? So I can see if you're using your practice because you're blinking beautifully. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's gently and in a nice way that moisturizes the eyes. So I'd like to thank you so much for the interview. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you and, and we could go on and on, but um, maybe we'll be able to have you back you on. Have, in future you, have episodes. Work, you have work to do, don't you? I do. I do. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, definitely um, for people interested, you know, check out Mayor's books, his his videos, his website, so many cool things going on. And we, we kind of scratched the surface today, but um, yeah, this has been, been a lot of fun to be with you today, so. I'm so happy we talked in depth. It's always nice to talk to your nation. Yeah, yeah, I like I like the long the long format instead of having to kind of cram, cram stuff in, so. All right, well, thank you so much, Mayor. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you everybody for listening and we'll check up with you again next time.